Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kelly Walters. I'm an assistant professor of communication design at Parsons School of Design. I am excited to share my presentation today, which is called Depictions of Blackness in American Graphic Design. To start, I wanted to give some context about the, the primary focus of my presentation. Uh, for me, I've been examining media archives to find depictions of African Americans or blackface minstrelsy in print design from entertainment industries during the Jim Crow era. In this process, I've been identifying the vernacular language that is used both typographically and linguistically in early American print design. A part of this process includes archival research. So I've been looking at a lot of archives, uh, digital archives now that we're in COVID, um, but a lot of material that was coming out of the post-reconstruction era. And with that material, I am often reflecting on that work, doing writing. I'm also making around that work in terms of printmaking and making patterns and creating videos. The focus of uh, the many of the, the print design examples and artifacts that I'm finding are really focused around looking at black gesture, at black emotion, and the commodification of black culture as a whole. To start, I wanted to, to look at a screen grab of my Spotify. Um, in terms of really specifically looking at uh, a, one area of print design, I've been looking at music sheet covers. And I wanted to think about the lineage of that in relation to what our understanding of music or album covers looks like today. So this screen grab is essentially just representative of the way in which we engage with print covers or album covers now in the Spotify or iTunes or digital streaming format, which is now small square. But in the past, uh, we would engage with um, these forms of, of album covers in CDs. I grew up with many CDs. We grew up with um, cassette tapes, some of us. Um, and so really thinking about how print design was, was taking form in the cassette tape realm. And then um, even prior to that, thinking about vinyl records um, and the square format that was uh, showing up for uh, any vinyl uh, material or vinyl records, I should say, um, prior to the cassette tape and prior to the CD. Now, that brings me to what predated both of those forms. Um, when we move all the way back um, and are thinking about how music was disseminated uh, in the post-reconstruction era, uh, a lot of that music was disseminated through music, uh, sheet music. And what's really significant are the outside covers of those sheet musics, which is what I'm interested in focusing in on sharing with you all today. And one of the early examples of uh, performers and a character that was developed called Jim Crow uh, was, was based around Thomas Rice playing Jim Crow in blackface. And so this gets us to an image example here that's from the Bowery Theater, New York City, of uh, this kind of reflected character that was connected to minstrelsy. If we look even further back and really dig deep into the history around this, um, I wanted to stem just a really short synopsis of a couple of things that were happening around this era. And this quote um, is actually sourced from NAACP, and it states from 1882 to 1968, there were 4,743 lynchings that occurred in the United States. And of these, people were lynched um, over the, out of the three, four, four, six were, of those, uh, they were black. And the blacks lynched accounted for 72.7% .7 of the people that were lynched. I think it's really important for us to understand this history as it connects to print design because it really influences who was being able to design work and what work was actually developed that represented uh, black people and black culture. And in addition to that, if we're really aware of kind of the, the mindset and the cultural dynamic that was happening at this moment, there was racial terrorism, there was lynchings, there were riots and segregation towards black people that were persistent and pervasive during this period um, in upholding white supremacy. And there's really a lot of echoes in terms of how I would think about what's happening today in many respects um, to the residual of things that had happened in 1882. 
And the last point I just want to highlight as well is that the Jim Crow laws that were created by white Southerners to enforce racial segregation throughout the South from the 1870s through the 1960s have had a deep impact on pretty much every sector, including design. Now, as we think about that history and we think about the examples that I was showing previously of kind of American pop culture and thinking about the album covers of print design, um, I want to sort of bring us uh, again back to think about the significance of that, to think about the significance of that history as it relates to uh, theater, music, and performance uh, that was happening during this era. And one of the quotes that I had pulled um, is from the University of South Florida's library's History of Minstrelsy from Jump Jim Crow to the Jazz Singer. And in this passage, it states, the persistence of minstrelsy and its widespread influence on all aspects of American culture is well documented by scholars, although its origins are not. No one can be sure when the first white man blackened up to play an African-American on stage. However, Thomas Dartmouth Daddy Rice developed the first popularly known blackface minstrel character called Jim Crow in 1830 and became the father of minstrelsy. So the image that I just previously showed was one illustration rendering of uh, T.D. Rice performing Jim Crow. And this next one uh, is another one that is also uh, connected to the kind of illustration of, of Jim Crow and specifically as uh, T.E. Rice, who's performing in that role. And on the right, I just have a couple of screen grabs from Childish Gambino's um, music video called This Is America. And I, I pull these in because the tug of war between thinking of past and present is very connected. And when I look at a lot of these archival materials, I'm often thinking about what is connected to the now, to um, mainstream media that I'm engaging with that is drawing upon references or influences from the past, such as this one. And so I connect these two because, again, my interest in um, this presentation is really thinking about the historical examples and references of uh, archival print material as it connects to our understanding of what Blackness means and how Black people or people perceive Black people <laughs> Um, are interconnected. So in my quest to really begin to think about print media and my interest in this time period, I looked at a lot of different examples of print ephemera. There were lobby cards, there were film posters, uh, which I'm also looking at. Um, there are postcards, uh, there are music sheet covers, as I'd mentioned, handbills and flyers. These were some of these early forms of print design um, within and across the entertainment industry. And for me, what was really, uh, really exciting was, was engaging with these music sheet covers. This was an area of focus that I had not previously engaged with. And again, I think stemming from my, my interest in uh, music and black music at that, but thinking about um, the, the design that is interconnected, I wanted to know more about the history and its, its legacy. Um, to earlier print forms that had been developed. So I want to break down an example of what a music sheet cover looks like. Uh, this particular work is called All I Want Is My Chickens. And as we see in this design, there is generally at the very top uh, a title for that, that song that is represented. It usually is in the top um, third of, of the sheet itself. And in addition to that, we also, as photography became a really prominent form, we also see the performer, um, often in blackface, sometimes a white figure who is in blackface that is um, going to be performing this song or is notable for performing this song. And as black performers actually became more prominent and prolific as well, we sometimes see a foot photograph inset on the illustrated design as well. Um, in addition to those things, we might see other sort of taglines or information that is meant to help uh, sell the song and sort of, uh, in this case, um, kind of reflect what kind of song that it might be. And then in the bottom section of many of these print covers as well, we'll see uh, reference to the music publisher. Um, often those are set within these kind of banner graphics. Um, really ornate, but also trying to reflect 
um, the location of that publisher, the name of that publisher in a really sort of regal way. So in a lot of my research that I've been doing, I started to, to um, pull out all of the different examples that I was finding of, of these music publishers. And typographically, they're so very interesting. Um, many of them are uh, obviously multiple people that have come together to form a publishing house. Sometimes you might see M. Whitmark and Sons or Howley Haviland and Co. Um, but generally, the sort of focus of the, the design is really primarily typographic, primarily um, uppercase text, and often, as I mentioned before, in some kind of banner um, that connects um, in, in a really Victorian, decorative, elegant way. And as I came across many of these, I really started to kind of uh, think about the color palette that was being used. I was really excited and engaged to kind of think about um, what types of illustrative figures would be um, integrated with these designs. And so we see a variation of, of references to music. Um, we also see sort of examples of individuals, depending on if their face is uh, connected to the publisher as well. Um, but there were so many, and I think that I'm, I'm still doing a lot of significant research around um, sort of the history of these pu music publishers at large as well. And if we dig even further within these designs, the other really significant thing about some of the music uh, sheet covers is that we find um, the individuals, who, some of them, who have illustrated these illustrations. And most often they're white men, um, some of them many European, um, but we also see, uh, again, Bert, Bert Colo, their Starmer, um, Gio O'Hart, um, Edgar Keller, um, again, I'm doing a lot of, of current research around um, looking for more information about a lot of these individuals and, and thinking about what they were creating and the significance of their work um, as they contributed to a series of, of music covers that were coming out of these different publishing houses. And so I pause here for a second to just highlight, right, that we have white music publishers that are creating um, or working with white songwriters and often the songwriters are sometimes synonymously the performers, but in some instances, we have the white songwriters creating work for white performers, and then most often thinking about white consumers who are, are really listening to this music, but also potentially purchasing the music at um, different music publishing sort of houses. And then the other thing that's really interesting about this time period as well is thinking about how white publishers we're also working with black songwriters or black performers. Um, sometimes they um, you know, weren't always attributed to, to the music that they produced. And so there was always tension, I think, there. But I think that the idea of a mixed audience was also really prevalent um, when working with and along this sort of lines as well. And so a few questions that come up for me um, include who had control over the design work process? Who was the audience? As I mentioned, you know, there could be primarily a white audience or a mixed audience or a primarily black audience. What are the implications of consuming these designs by black audiences and non-black audiences? And what of black visual culture was generated by white artists and designers, right? That this is something that I'm grappling a lot with in thinking about that a lot of historical examples of what I thought was black visual culture um, more, or what is, is also defined by white artists and designers. And so to pull out another really salient quote, um, this is from Stephanie Dunson in The Minstrel in the Parlor, 19th Century Sheet Music and the Domestication of Black Minstrelsy. And in her dissertation, she wrote, as a popular cultural medium, 19th century sheet music expressed the exchange of ideas, standards, and assumptions that informed and demonstrated predominant attitudes of the American populace. And so this is really important to highlight, right? That music scores and music sheet, sheet music rather, the outside covers in particular, they, they were markers of national identity, as she notes. It measures changing attitudes about family values and patriotism. It served to negotiate between public entertainment and the evolving boundaries of the American home and it speaks directly to the expanding role of consumption, the burgeoning national habit of assuring cultural position, 
through the accumulation of material objects. And so I, I really was connected to um, her sort of interpretation of this and thinking about how the music sh uh, she cover and really the music itself uh, was disseminating as, um, as though it were a sort of form of currency in a way, right? That it was printed out, it was then potentially bought, and then it was also brought home and engaged with in, uh, in the home. And so in looking at a lot of these sheet music, uh, I was really thinking about a, a few different categories, categories of uh, examples that I was finding. Um, one thing that's really important to note is how African-American vernacular was being represented as well. In this particular one, we see that there's a reference to what would be uh, correctly said as masters in the cold ground, but in this case, we see that it's clearly trying to reflect what would have been considered a black voice. And Stephen C. Foster uh, is a prolific white composer during this era who was producing so many um, really celebrated ex examples of music. Um, but in this case, this is an example of a plantation song that really sort of, um, is, as we'll show in a couple of other examples, reflecting this interest in nostalgia of the past. But ultimately, what's significant about this work is that we see how typographically and linguistically um, blackness is being considered um, and treated within the design. Inside the interior of a lot of the music scores, we, we see kind of like a small booklet, right? The, the music notes, the lyrics of the song, and then often in the back cover, there are references to other songs that have been generated and or uh, sometimes promotions to performances and uh, places where these songs will be um, actually uh, given out live. And in thinking about the accent, um, another really important critical aspect that came up for me as well was was the uh, Mary Baraka um, sort of passage that he wrote. And he shows up a couple times in my presentation because I think he does a really great job in his book, Blues People, um, about talking about the significance of this music and its impact on American culture. Um, but what's most significant here is that for, for one of the passages, he noted that what is now, or what is called now a Southern accent or Negro speech was once simply the, the accent of a foreigner trying to speak a new and an unfamiliar language. And so I think this is really important also because I think often the, the idea that black people are not smart or considered uh, unintelligible or things like that, when we think about the fact that we had uh, slaves that came from a previous uh, foreign country um, that spoke another language, right? We're talking about the fact that there was clearly a, a space of time that needed to be developed to sort of acquire and understand uh, this new language in this new land. And so I think his sort of assessment is really spot on. And in thinking about other forms of, of print design, um, uh, within this realm of, of music scores and music sheet covers. Um, as I mentioned before, plantation life was really significant. And so we often see illustrations in some of the earlier works of, of Black individuals who are dancing, clearly within uh, a more sort of rural environment, but also feeling more joyous in nature, that this was a period that was uh, really positive in, in, in thought. But if we think about the fact that these are potentially illustrated by black individuals, there becomes a different, inter uh, or white individuals rather, we, there's a different interpretation of, of what is being prioritized and thought to be the best of times. Uh, another example is I'm going back to Dixieland, right? And in this one, again, we see, um, we see black individuals in the fields. Uh, we see a mother that is caring for their child. But again, it's, it's drawn in such a way that has this feeling of nostalgia that also has this feeling of um, sort of hearkening of wanting to go back um, as even the lyrics in the song is, is stated. And when we think about this um, in relation to kind of music, uh, like slave music and slave musicians, Eileen Southern is another really critical sort of scholar that I have found in my research um, that I feel also reflects a really great sort of understanding of what's happening in this time. 
Um, and at, and w just to kind of highlight a small segment of this, uh, of this passage, the last bit at the end is that the public often attended the concerts of black performers out of mere curiosity, but remained to acclaim the sound of a beautiful voice or the exhibition of extraordinary technique. And so this begins to sort of highlight the, the sort of revered nature of black culture by white audiences um, and thinking about how white composers and songwriters were actually trying to reflect um, what they felt was reminiscent of that. And so the other last few sort of examples of things that I am encountering in this research include how social class is being represented. So in this particular example, I ain't seen no messenger boy, right? Typographically, we see a really sort of um, handwritten, illustrated sort of design quality to this work. There is the inset of a photograph of a small black child and a white woman. And again, we see the idea of class being represented, who's in control, who's in power. Um, and so the design is reflecting these, these dynamics. Uh, they're also reflecting gender roles, right? That we see, um, in this case, your money's no good. This is an example of a, a black woman sort of responding to a black man. Uh, and then we have the inset of a character who's in a white man who's in black face. And there's so many layers that um, within this work illustrated um, from what she's rep representing and saying no, how there's this sort of uh, really ornate uh, decorative component that's around the border of the design that is representing uh, the money symbol. Um, but there's all of these levels of, of uh, what one's role is, uh, status, um, economic status, um, really playing out in a lot of these print designs. And then when it comes to children, uh, I think what's even more disturbing coming out of this era or how children are being represented. And this one, um, what's really sort of interesting about what's happening here is similarly, there's this decorative floral border which makes it feel very positive in nature. Um, but then as we look closer, right, uh, the tag that's, uh, that's hanging off of the, the actual stroller itself is nobody's gonna steal me basically. And so there's this really sort of disturbing concept around value uh, and thinking about black people, and in this case, black children and what the quality of, uh, or values of uh, a black child is worth. And in terms of other examples, uh, Prancing Piccaninny's characteristic march and cakewalk, this music sheet cover really reflects sort of the ominous and um, sort of disturbing quality of how children uh, were being represented in this case, that also seem kind of demonic and demonstrative in nature. And so I think that it's important to kind of look at some of these examples where we see the idea of gathering, uh, we see the idea of multiple children together being considered almost a scary um, sort of feel that they're all kind of here. Yet at the same time, there's kind of this, um, you know, typographic uh, element that dominates the focus of the design at the top um, that's set in red, um, but also with our publisher information that's set below um, as previous examples. And one of the last categories is in relation to colorism. And, and we see in this, this work, um, really thinking about how the closer you are uh, uh, physically to white, the more that that is perceived to be better. Um, in this work, I, I won't play second fiddle to no yellow girl. We really see it typographically set out um, how uh, what this black woman kind of what I imagine would be talking to this black man would be saying in relation to uh, not wanting to be considered second to or uh, less than, um, but really thinking about how col color actually is playing a role. And in this one, another really even more kind of uh, sort of eccentric one, this is from 1901, uh, and this actually features two black performers, really prolific performers during this era, Williams and Walker. And this is where we also begin to see a really interesting shaping of language that's coming from a black voice, um, but in reference to kind of, again, these colorism aspects. And so she's getting more like the white folks every day, to me that has a very specific white uh, black voice. Um, and then we also see sort of the inset of uh, a really decorative Victorian border, 
um, with a black woman that's it's situated in there in terms of who they're referencing. And so all of these examples are, are really sort of um, immersed in this time period. And just again, one other last quote from Amaria Baraka um, is, is that this idea of the emulation of white society um, in terms of social class and economic hierarchy is showing up in these print, print works and they're embedding uh, all of these ideologies around how language is used and how blackness is being seen both by black people and by white folks who are also designing and creating these songs that are being consumed by a wide audience. And so the last few slides that I want to share are in reference to the work, uh, the print design work that I'm doing that's in response to a lot of these findings. Um, often I'm sort of exploring, you know, taking scans or, or working with um, the examples of these original works. And I'm trying to create a series of videos or, or abstractions from them. I often am exploring the typographic qualities of the original print design. And in terms of layering and texture, I'm really thinking about the qualities of, of the letter forms and what they do when they're extracted from their original source. And uh, there's this layering effect that I've been trying to think about in terms of um, you know, taking it out of perhaps some of the more kind of sensitive imagery and really focusing in on um, what can be left. And I see a lot of these as type specimens, right? They're sort of extracted from, um, modified, and then represented in this sort of um, really simplistic typographic way. And so for me, I'm, I'm really thinking about what does color do when it shifts? Um, what does the gradient mean? What does it mean when it's even more vibrant in color? How does it change our read of this work? Um, does it allow us to engage with the, the qualities of the letter forms differently? Um, you know, what, what does it mean to begin to sort of play inside of um, itself with the, the ways the letter forms um, can potentially be set uh, within other sort of uh, uh, abstracts of, of themselves? And so these are, are experiments and I'm not exactly sure where they're going yet, um, but they're a way for me to dive deeply into this research and then respond um, where I you know, am really sort of drawn to how to continue to make variation. And so this video is really, you know, almost like a screen grab of my process of of you know, messing with and, and creating degradations and deconstructions of these original works uh, and thinking about what's left and what it means to sort of multiply on top of themselves. Um, and so a lot of this is, is influencing um, work that I'm also doing that's looking at film culture as well, black film culture. Um, but some of the, the ways that I, I'm trying to connect the dots for me in this research is, is through the act of making. And so uh, a lot of this is exploratory um, and is ongoing and is really also thinking about the material choice of where and how these are printed. And so the last couple of images here are um, just some of the printouts I've been doing at home, um, thinking about the different types of paper that change the way we are able to engage with this work. Um, and thinking about what it means to have this as multiples, almost thinking about these as, uh, as posters moving from just a simple sheet cover, um, and thinking about what the repetition could potentially mean um, when aggregated as a whole. And so with that, I, I thank you all for listening and um, you know, attending this lecture. Uh, in terms of further reading, if any of you are interested in, in a lot of this uh, material, um, but also the analysis of what's happening during these time periods, uh, I, I would definitely encourage you to look at any of these books um, that have uh, come up in my research. And there's countless others, but these are a few that are really significant. And thank you so much for um, listening in.
Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for uh, for the presentation, for the prepared video. Uh, I see really a lot of participants here today in the session. Uh, I must confess that it's probably more than uh, than in the most of the previous ones. So thank you all for coming. And I guess we are ready to start the discussion. So please feel free to use the chat. You have the general room, as I said, and the Q and A section. And in case you have like any question, just type it. I will real loud for yep. everyone to hear it and yeah so um we have a first question uh where are you going now with the research plans for the one or three years approximately um i i, I think that ideally um i would have been able to um, go to physical archives. I, I was hoping to do that this year. Um, but I think in lieu of kind of physically going to places to kind of look at actual material, I've been looking at a lot of digital archives um, and I'm finding there's material that's actually accessible online through a lot of libraries. Um, a lot of museums have uh, access to material. Um, and so I think in terms of where I'm going, I'm just continuing to look at artifacts that I've not encountered before. Um, and then also try to make sense of what they mean given the time period and, and also understand um, how it's influencing so much of our culture today. So I think there's just a lot of continued work that I'm hoping to do um, in, in looking for material, but also you know, as a design practitioner making around that material. And I've gotten questions about why and how I'm doing that, but uh, it's part of my process as a maker first um, and sort of almost like a researcher second. I've been wanting to kind of navigate how to blend the two as part of my process. Uh, so there's definitely lots left to do. So we, we have a lot of thank yous in the chat. Uh, yeah, maker first, researcher second. Yeah, well stated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe Kelly could also say like um, about some uh, other interesting interesting moments in the process of the research of the discoveries. Uh, like what was oh okay we have another question. So how important was the influence of Luno design of black on black music? Um, I haven't gotten to that point. I think that's what I think a little bit later, if I'm not mistaken, the creation of Blue Note. And you can don't quote me, but I think it's a little further on um, in terms of time period. And I haven't navigated around all of that sort of history yet. I think I, um, you know, do know that there is significant influence um, around the designs that were coming out of that era as well. And often, again, there's a lot of, of white artists, photographers, there were a lot of white photographers that were producing um, graphics, or not graphics, but just photography that are within the designs of those record albums. And so I think that there's a, just a heavy influence of, um, a lot of different shapes or sh a lot of different ways that design or black culture has been shaped um, by white culture or white artists. And so I, I've been just trying to understand, um, you know, as far back as I can go, um, what, when that began and how it started. And so I think right now I'm most kind of most recently sort of focused on, um, the post reconstruction era, but I'm hoping to make my way forward um, and kind of dive deeper there. Thank you for the answer. And we have an okay, there is probably going to be a small discussion. Okay. So um, Laura also asks. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, do you plan on developing time from uh, on developing time from your work? I I think so. I think in previous sort of um, presentations that I've shared this work, I'm I'm getting more questions that are making me think about it differently, and um, from almost seeing these as where I'm kind of creating these type specimens. I'm realizing that they could actually be adapted into typography as well. And so I think there's definitely um, uh, like hopes for that uh, because I think, you know, I think what I'm drawn to is how typographically these letter forms have been rendered despite what language um, in today's context might be a little uncomfortable or are not commonplace anymore. And so I'm trying to sort of almost separate the two and kind of have kind of a admiration for the typography, even though uh, what I'm seeing in a lot of these print, um, print design examples are and can be really problematic. Um, so in short, yes, I think that there definitely could be um, a direction of this work that develops uh, typography from it. Thank you. And we also have the next question from, from Heather. Uh, so how is your research manifesting in your teaching and classes? And do you see the influence on your students as they enter the world? Yeah, very nice question. Um, how is your research? Uh, it's definitely coming up in classes that I'm teaching. I, I taught a version of um, a class last semester that was like modeled on the beginning of this research. And I'm hoping to teach another class this spring that sort of deepens a lot of, of um, questions that are coming up in forums like this or questions that I've gotten from students, previous students around how I'm sharing this material. Um, and so I, I do think it will have an influence. I think it's already my engagement with, with kind of looking at a lot of this historical reference um, has has been making me rethink my own sort of ideologies and, and thoughts around uh, what Black visual culture is and also looking more narrowly into like an area that um, isn't necessarily covered. I think it's a very specific area of design. Um, and I think it there's so much to kind of be gained in that space if we see that as like... Um, you know, the precursor to the album covers that we see today or the square, the square graphic that's on the Spotify, which is kind of where I started. And so I just find that there's interconnection there. Um, and I think starting from the, the present and working our way back, I think it's helpful for students to kind of find and track that as a line um, in their understanding of what they're looking at. Thank you for the answer. And the next one comes from Boris. Uh, so you briefly showed now the imagery you are looking at uh, intertwines with the current blackness in pop culture. And could you elaborate a bit more on that? I mean, how the images you are discovering influence in your view, of course, the current time. Could you elaborate a bit more on? Yeah. I'm just trying to understand the question. Uh, uh, on like pop culture references of today? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm in a previous presentation, I, I've made like direct links to things that I find connected to um, a lot of these artifacts. So I guess one way that I can sort of describe it is that um, most recently I've been watching Lovecraft Country. And so I think that um, inside of that television show on HBO, uh, so much of the kind of references that are showing up in that show stem from examples that even show up in these kind of print artifacts. And so um, there's one episode most recently, oops, sorry, one episode most recently that came with like kind of the Piccaninny character. And one of the ones that I showed um, today in this presentation um, really look like the children that were sort of um, created inside of that show. And there's so many examples of um, finding 2020 or, you know, most contemporary examples of, of either music videos, of album covers, of film um, that like really have embedded 
signals that are based on around like what has been stated around um, the voice of the of a black character um, or what is a, a, a way to sort of identify blackness, if that makes sense. And so I think I'm looking at past and present and a lot of this research for me before I kind of went all the way back um, into like, you know, 1865, I was looking at a lot of like memes and animated GIFs and uh, a lot of things that are disseminating through cell phones and, and um, you know, social media and, and wanting to understand why things were so funny uh, and why, you know, why is like the way Oprah is reacting, how does that connect to blackface or how does that connect to minstrelsy or how, how is like, you know, these digital sort of artifacts of blackness or black gesture, how do those connect to, uh, you know, print designs that were coming out of an earlier time period? Um, so I, I do think that there's um, great connection there. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we have another question from Heather. Uh, so she says that it seems ITIPI uh, is a huge international audience of academia and industry. And is there any way this international audience can help deepen your research or access to achieves and materials? Is that for me or for the audience too? I mean, well, uh... I, yeah, I guess <laughs> now when I'm reading the question, yes. Yeah, so. <clears throat> I mean, it would be great if there's uh, people who are listening um, and sort of thinking about any of this material. Um, you know, I'm open to discussion and connecting with those that have similar questions or trying to sort of navigate that. So, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully there's connection here. Yeah, sure. It's 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 really a great opportunity now to uh to have this possibility like to combine all um yeah yeah to combine this uh, international audience and just to share and just to think and really to deepen in in such uh topics which you are bringing today here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, th I think it was a really great research. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions. Yeah, because also I would say that uh, it really depends on the region, because, for example, in, in the regions of Eastern Europe, um, we do not bring up these topics that frequently and not many, not that many people have the accessibility to really look at some performances and to, I don't know, uh, research on this topic. Uh, and such conferences, like when we can access from different parts of the world, even if in our part of the world, this topic is not very well discussed, just to educate ourselves. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the the discussion around race and specifically, you know, around African-American culture, African-American history. Um, there's so many scholars that I admire that have done significant research, um, you know, that surpasses even where I'm at, that I, I feel like truly kind of is emblematic of, of all the different ways of, of seeing culture, understanding culture, but also I think what I'm so excited about at this moment is like thinking about how that, that scholarship influences the scholarship and design and analysis around the significance of works that that are often neglected in being shown in a lot of history historical books or the canon itself and so i think it's it's definitely it doesn't come without challenge i think i'm often conflicted about the material that i'm i'm engaging with and what it means and you know i think about um you know, what is it, what is it sort of, what is the process that I'm doing to not only find these works, but then try to kind of design around and on top of them. And so I think that there's, uh, you know, a, there's an importance in it. I find it to be important. I find it to also be really urgent work, um, given where we are socially and politically at this moment. Um, and so I think, 
it's, I think so much is being um, funneled through and outside of the work and I'm inspired by and activated by like all of the sort of adversity and oppression that's also happening um, to make me want to sort of engage with this material and continue to sort of find like nuanced ways of understanding. Um, so I think however I can do that and share that with audiences where, you know, this discussion is not necessarily being had, um, the questions that are posed have me really kind of, um, think introspectively about you know, what I was taught, um, what I'm thinking I know, um, what has come to me through like pop culture and what is not real and what is real and kind of questioning all of that, I think, uh, simultaneously. Yes, so, and, and we have a next message from Laura. Uh, and she writes, uh, I was thinking about how exploring the past makes us understand the present and can serve to imagine futures. So how do you think the visual, this visual language could translate in the way future visual languages? Ooh, um, difficult question. How do you think this visual language could translate in that way? Um, I mean, here's another thought, right? I think that, um, you know, I'm someone who often kind of looks at a lot of like existing material and is like a, is interested in remix and is interested in uh, kind of the combination of a contemporary lens on top of what might be a historical uh, print example. And so in some ways, like I've talked with different friends and colleagues about what this process actually is. And, and one way that I've begun to kind of think about even this, the last few slides of this presentation of seeing that as Afrofuturist work and to see that as, um, as a, as a way of designing on top of, or expanding on top of what, what has existed from a previous time. So I think that in some ways I, I, I am sort of enacting sort of a more futurist sort of approach to these works or the way that I'm beginning to think about that, um, where, you know, I'm having to go to the past and for me to go to the past, I'm coming from the future. I don't know if that's kind of like, you know, a little sci-fi oriented, but, you know, I, it, it's been making me think about what that means. And for me to kind of go from 2020 to like 1901, like I am of the future, I am the future. And so I think to see this as a way of bringing it forward um, or bringing the past forward, um, you know, and, and having it be a marker for this moment that might be influencing, you know, people or uh, cultures that have not seen this work in another 20 years. I'm curious what that sort of looks like. Um, what's the response to what I'm doing that's a response to, you know, almost 100 years that predate me? Um, so I think that's kind of how I'm beginning to kind of think about, um, you know, the translation of these languages visually um, and linguistically as well. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you for, for all your questions and for participating in this discussion. Uh, pretty active chat we're having in this session. Um, I'm really happy with that.